Bonjour à tous. Ah, C'est peut-être un peu fort. Donc, bonjour euh, Jean-Michel. Est-ce euh, que tu m'entends euh, Oui, bonjour. Est-ce que vous m'entendez aussi oui, alors ce n'était pas très fort de notre côté. Je ne sais pas si c'est le son un peu très fort. Enfin, euh, très fort. Alors, je vais essayer de me rapprocher de mon micro. Est-ce que là, ça va mieux Oui, c'est un peu mieux. OK. Euh, donc, je vais te laisser euh, lancer cette session euh, sur les technologies innovantes. D'accord, euh, parfait. Voilà. Euh, merci beaucoup pour, euh, pour l'introduction. Donc, euh, on, va, on va aborder euh, la session sur l'axe euh, technologie du futur. Donc, on va avoir euh, deux présentations. La première par le docteur Aïda Todrissagnal du LIRM sur le Neuromorphic Computing with Oscillatory Neural Networks. Et la deuxième par Damien Kerlios du C2N sur Memory Centric Artificial Intelligence. Euh, donc, euh, je vais euh, introduire euh, Aïda. Euh, donc, Aïda euh, Todrissagnal est euh, directeur de recherche au CNRS, au LIRM, et euh, membre senior de I3E. Euh, donc, euh, Aïda est, a été euh, experte euh, visite visiteurs euh, au Cambridge Graphen Center and Wolfson's College at the University of Cambridge euh, de 2016 à 2007. Avant, elle était euh, ingénieure R&D euh, pour euh, le Fermi National Accelerator Laboratory. Elle a eu aussi des euh, positions comme euh, euh, recherche, euh, de recherche euh, chez Mentor Graphics, Cadence Design System et ST Microelectronics et finalement IBM euh, Watson Research Center. Euh, ces centres d'intérêt en recherche se font sur les technologies émergentes et sur les nouveaux euh, paradigmes de, de calcul, comme le neuromorphique et euh, le quantum computing. Euh, donc, euh, je laisse euh, la parole à, à Aïda. Et euh, du coup, je pense que je dois arrêter de partager mon écran. Ou c'est bon OK. OK, parfait. Okay, so good morning, uh, good morning, everyone. So thank you for the introduction, Jean-Michel, and thank you for having me here. Um, I couldn't be there with you, but um, I hope you are having a good workshop. Uh, can you hear and see my screen okay? Uh, can you see my screen uh, so far? Okay, great, and you can hear me fine. Okay, great, thank you. So yes, I am uh, Aida Todrissagnal. I'm a director of research at CNRS. I'm at the LIRM Laboratory in Montpellier, France. And I'll talk a little bit today about the neuromorphic computing with oscillatory neural networks uh, on the context of a European project that I'm currently leading, which is the NEURON. And there we have several partners, so us CNRS, but also a consortium from IBM, Fra Hanover, C6 Spain, Silvaco, and AI Emergence. So um, I structured the talk, uh, it, it's a very short talk, but I thought it was important to cover two parts into it. So a little bit the context in terms of why into neuromorphic computing and engineering, and the second part more into the oscillatory neural networks, how we compute with oscillators, uh, what would be the devices, and also large scale implementation all the way to uh, applications and demonstrators. So. The context of this, of this work is very much the, the revolution of the industry that we are currently facing. And we are, uh, as you all know, we are an in industry 4.0 now, where there is an ambiguous amount of um, cyber physical systems out there that are currently um, uh, sensing a lot of data. They are uh, currently a lot of communication through this system. So the internet of things in order to be able to bring some artificial intelligence in these um, in, in this distributed embedded systems. And they are being currently uh, adopted very much from every aspect of industry. So from um, healthcare, from transport, education, you name it, all sort of, um, all type of industries are currently adopting in order to be able to bring more automation and more AI tasks into this, uh, into these IoT systems. And what is of interest is that indeed there is a need for AI, but we also have, uh, with all of this um, amount, uh, abundance amount of data, 
we're also having an energy problem, right? So in order to cope with all this techno um, revolution in terms of technology, what we are seeing, there is a lot of data science methods, machine learning techniques and AI algorithms that have emerged and typically employing neural networks and also deep learning techniques. And what is the other side of this is that all of this training to train such a massive, um, large neural networks requires a lot amount of data and also computing resources that is currently not sustainable due to their energy demand. We saw in terms of the global electricity supply demand, but also in terms of their carbon emissions. So the computation carbon footprint. Just to take an example for it's the GPT-3. So you might've heard of it, which is um, a generative pre-trained transformer three. And it generates, um, it's, it's a language model. So it generates a human-like test. And if you were to run it on a single computer, it will take more than 27 years and a computation would generate over 78,000 pounds of CO2 emission. So it's, there is a critical, these are critical concerns with both in terms of the energy uh, demand, but also in terms of the emissions. So we have a challenge with respect to the increasing amount of data and the energy demand of this to extract the information. And it's important to also put it in the context of the technology. So a lot of the computations at this point is done on Bernoulli computing. And as we know with deep scaling, so as we go into deep sub, sub nanometer node, we have more and more of challenge with the interconnect. So the devices are getting fast. We are you know, going beyond FinFET to, to stack sheets of uh, devices in order to have a better control of the channel while the interconnects have not kept up with scaling. We are having a problem in terms of their parasitics, which impact in performance, reliability, and of course, power consumption. And this communication between the processor and the memory, also known as the Newman bottleneck, is the main problem as we are trying to build larger systems. And also as there is a lot of communication that we need to sustain on these neural networks, especially for the synaptic weights. And the other challenge is the heat wall. So there is a lot of thermal built up on the system, especially when you have such large scale and also very dense devices on the same system. Um, the thermal build up and how to get the heat away. So the thermal dissipation is becoming a challenge and it's, this is the right moment as well as for the community that has shifted toward brain inspired or in memory computing. So toward other um, type of architectures where we can exploit the full parallelism. So more toward analog and mixed signal design. And uh, this has been to, to emulate a lot of the, what we know from uh, biological neural networks or from neuroscience and how to emulate them into uh, architecture, into hardware. So this allows for this full, fully parallel parallelism and computing toward energy efficient uh, paradigm, which also addresses this need for low power and sustainable green AI. And the focus in this work that I will be talking about has been to cover some of the aspects. What are the materials? What are the materials that we can actually start to emulate some of this, at least some of this um, biological or plasticity that we see in biological neural networks and the devices, architectures, implementation, all the way to demonstrators. Also, it's important to bring this with respect to the state of the art. So there is a lot of progress in terms of um, neuromorphic computing, but also in memory computing. And it's important to put this with respect to the energy efficiency or the power consumption of the brain, right? So we know that the, in the brain, there are billions of neurons, quadrillions of synapses at about consuming 20 watts. And there's been a, a tremendous amount of progress, especially with the framework from the European uh, the brain, um, the flagship, the human brain flagships so as Spinnaker and brain scale to be the first multi-core systems. So wafer scale development integrated systems for multi-core um, and also being able to have thousands of these multi-core systems to be able to emulate this uh, synaptic and to have some in silico simulation of these neural networks and a very low power consumption. And from the other industries, so from Intel, Loihi has also have been able to show this uh, thousands of artificial neurons, but in a digital asynchronous architecture. And uh, what has been interesting in Loihi that also IBM True North has taken the same 
uh, development. So we have this digital asynchronous um, uh, uh, systems. But what has been interesting and really to see that we can now also emulate some of these spiking based learning algorithms that we know from neuroscience. So it's been interesting also to go into more complex, into uh, more complex neural networks and learning um, algorithms implementation. But there is a need as we go forward and especially into artificial intelligence at the edge, there is a need for having some way this capability that the system can be can learn and also can adapt as throughout its operational during throughout its lifetime. Why this is important because a lot of the training currently has been done in the cloud. And a lot of the training has been done in the data center because that's where you have a lot of resources, you have precision, you have performance. But now as we are going toward this paradigm where a lot of the AI or at least some tasks will be needing some immediate or real time um, decision making. So you also, some of the system are autonomous. You need to have some capability on the system so they also can online perform online learning. So there is this need and there is this opportunity now to think about how to bring this capability to edge devices. And you can take an example in, um, in high definition cameras or in healthcare, where you are limited to send data to due to the bandwidth all the way to the cloud. So you are, there is bandwidth, there is also latency, you need to be able to process this data as where the data is available. So right there in, in, um, in the real time, for example, even in a car, uh, the sensors, the data information coming from sensors, you need to be able to extract information or process it in real time rather than having to send it over the cloud and then coming back into, in, into the edge. So for that reason, there is um, a, a tremendous amount of effort from the community to, to think what, how to implement this online learning and inference at the edge. What would be the underlying architectures and also how these algorithms would be implemented in hardware, given that we have limited resources at the edge in terms of uh, space, area, computing capability, but also they are a lot of them are battery based devices so there is the power consumption it's key so not only the the data treatment the online but also the energy efficiency of subsystems and from the community but also both industry and academia there's been a lot of efforts in terms to going beyond CMOS so what would be the the materials and devices to enable um, a very energy efficient but also emulating some of this biological behavior nonlinear behavior that we see in uh, cognitive systems. And some of them, or the main principal ones that I'll outline here, are based on RERAM, which is the migration of defects such as oxygen vacancies or metallic ions, and the phase change memories, where you have the two phases change from amorphous to crystalline, so which is joule heating based, so the temperature dependent change in resistivity. And there is also this change in magnetic polarization um, and to STT or MRAMs. So these are the main um, memristor based devices that can revolutionize and, and also a lot of the community has been focusing into um, developing cross border arrays, but even uh, in memory computing with this type of memristors. And in the current framework, so in Aaron, what has been our focus is we also want to emulate and take um, inspiration from biological neural networks and especially from the rhythmic behavior. Uh, looking into from, um, if, if you look into the neuroscience or what we have understood is that there is a lot of rhythm behavior, so uh, neurons that spike and fire together. So this is ubiquitous in neurocortex, hippocampus, olfactory bulb. So, and what is important about this uh, is that we want to be able to compute similarly with this type of brain waves or this type of a signal but now in architecture or in hardware. What is the underlying difference between the other types, for example, spiking neural networks where you're looking at the time dependency when the spikes are being fired, we are looking into the phase relationship between the signals. It's important to, to uh, compare, for example, what we have in a digital logic, if it's a ground zero, you would have um, the logic zero. And if it's a logic, if the voltage is at VDD, then you would uh, decode that as a one. 
While in computing in phase with the oscillators that we are uh, developing in this project, we're looking at the phase difference between them. So for example, here you have a blue and a red, and you can see that they are at 180 phase difference between each other. So this signal, the blue one would be encoded as a zero and the other one is a one. So this is the main underlying difference. So rather than looking into in time to where they are, uh, when they are spiking, we are looking at the phase difference between signals. So we are more interested in the phase relationship rather than the time um, dependency or when they, are, when they are firing. And to kind of give you a very high level, and I'll talk a little bit more in detail of this pieces of the architecture, how would this oscillatory neural network look like? So here you have an illustration, you have the neurons, so the oscillators, which will be based on insulating metallic transition vanadium dioxide oscillators. I'll talk about them, how they operate. And the synaptic array, which is based on 2D transition metal decalgonide mobile denium disulfide memristors. And this is the main memory as well of this system. Now, again, I want to highlight what is the difference between spiking and oscillating neural networks. In the spiking neural network, you are very much dependent, as I mentioned, to the time. When do they spike? and also the voltage amplitude. And in order to be able to integrate and understand if that's a logic one or a logic zero. And in oscillating neural networks, as I mentioned, the, diff the, the underlying, I'd say, um, difference and also property of this neural network is the phase relationship. As you can see here, these two signals being out of phase, that would mean that there is an output or encoded as a logic one. And then being in phase is a logic zero. So this is the underlying difference between them. And also you can immediately see that we are less dependent on the voltage amplitude. That means the voltage amplitude can be lowered and that allows to explore even further this low power computing paradigm. And we also have a poster in the GDR and I hope you had a chance to also interact with my students. Um, and also get to know a little bit more about our developments in, the, in this uh, framework. So going further, I want to illustrate this as um, you have, for example, an image here being a fuzzy image and each of these pixels is an oscillator and the white pixels means that they are, all the oscillators are switching at the same time and the black means that they are switching at 180 uh, phase difference and gray is something in between. So when you give a fuzzy pixel and you decide uh, after some analytical computation, what would be the memory or what would be the synaptic weights that um, actually represent the memory of the system, you can retrieve the output that has been uh, memorized in the system. So you can retrieve the actual, the correct um, image. And the underlying um, feature of the oscillatory neural network is very much based on the associative memory property as the Hopefield neural networks, which have been known in the community for the last 30 years or so. And the critical um, aspect of this is how to decide what would be the synaptic weights, because that would also um, impact what is the memory and also how much, what is the memory capacity of the system. So here to give you an intuition, you might have seen this also on YouTube, you start uh, metronomes, which represent oscillators at any random time, and you have the base that is also moving as a respect to these oscillators. So what is of interest here to see is that the oscillators after some cycles, they'll start to synchronize. And what allows this synchronization is the base. For us, the base is this synaptic coupling or the weights. And if we want, for example, to memorize something, we need to decide how this base should be. So in a sense, this is the, the, to give you a little bit of the intuition how to compute with oscillators would look like. You can see by now, they are all synchronized. So they can start randomly and then synchronize as a respect to this uh, synaptic. So what are the oscillators? So how can we actually develop these oscillators to behave in this behavior? And in the context we have uh, of the Neuron project, we have uh, collaborations with uh, IBM partners that have developed uh, planar devices and crossbar devices based on vanadium dioxide, which you can see here is the, this thin sheet layer between the two electrodes and the VO2, and here is the crossbar configuration. And the main principle of this device is that it actually changes its phase due to temperature. So here you have the temperature. So at in first, it starts in a monoclinic um, uh, phase. So it's an insulator with a very high resistivity. 
as it heats up, you can see that resistivity goes down, so it becomes rutile, so it's a metallic face. And if you need to cool it, so when you reset it, and you'll see that it will take this path and it will become back an insulator. So this phase change transition, there is this hysteresis. And this is what we are exploiting to have an oscillator behavior out of this device. So it's important to also see that this device has a very interesting property because it can change from an insulating to a metal transition at about 340 Kelvin. And there is a very complex behavior also to understand this dual heating and also how does this phase change uh, transition happens. So the resistive, um, uh, so the, the, the resistive change uh, and also the non-uniformity on the device. So for example, here, these are some illustration to show the non-uniform temperature and how this actually arises. So some of the grain boundaries would heat up and also that would create further this, um, the, the, the resistive path or the shortest resistive path in order to be able to have this non um, non-uniform distribution, but also to have this mechanism on the VO2 behavior. It's also very complex because as the temperature um, heats up, some of these phases coexist. And uh, this is, makes it a complex behavior to, from a device physics point of view to understand that there's been a lot of focus in our team on the TCAD simulation and also calibration of such models. From even further to understand the, the physics behavior or more the switching mechanism behavior on these devices, we have looked into quantum mechanical simulations or starting from DFT, so density function theory, um, the structures where we understand the impact, for example, of the metal electrodes on the thermal transport on the device. And also, for example, on the MOS2 to understand the impact of the electrodes and also how would this impact this working mechanism and also what is the underlying uh, memory stiff um, mechanism on such devices. There is a lot of ambiguity and also discussion from the community on, for example, on MOS2, if uh, what is this working mechanism? Is it based to charge transfer? Is it based to the dopants, the defects due to the ion transport? So there is a lot of uh, understanding going underneath to see what are the, the main mechanisms for this um, uh, memory stiff behavior on MOS2. And so starting from a crossfire device such as this one here, and if you insert an, uh, an external resistance and capacitor, you can now uh, un and understand that there is this uh, region. So between the high resistive state and low resistive state, so the between insulating and metallic, there is also this NDR region, so negative difference or resistance region where these oscillations are happening. And this is of interest to us in order to build circuits and architectures from such devices. And you can see here as well that you can, uh, these, uh, for example, on the black line here, this is the output. So you can see the oscillating behavior and in blue is the temperature transition going from insulating uh, to metallic and also is portrayed here. So as the device uh, switches from one phase to so insulating metallic, you can also see the temperature uh, difference. So the temperature variation on the lattice of the, of the VO2 device. And this has been important because based on uh, such, so starting from DFT, starting from TCAD, we can understand the devices, so we can perform um, simulations at the device level and then at the circuit level and all the way to architecture level. So this is something that's been of interest to us in order to be able to explore what are the device physics behavior that will impact the architecture in terms of energy, in terms of performance, also in terms of frequency of switching of this, of this system. So this has been something that we are currently developing in the framework of the project, but also with the collaboration of Silvaco. So now that goes to how we compute. So from a single device, how do we go further? So how do we build a system out of it? So it's important to, uh, to let you know about the little bit about the theory of pattern recognition with oscillatory neural networks. So this was established early in 2000 from Izhikovic, where you can memorize patterns. So basically you can establish the weights uh, via the heavy learning rules. For example, these are the patterns to be memorized. And this is the fuzzy pattern that you want to recognize and see if the system will, after several cycles, will recognize. And you can see here, for example, the oscillator, oscillatory activity of the network. You can see that how it receives cycle by cycle the correct image. And also sometimes the inverse of it because they are both equally uh, available. And you can also see the phase, uh, relative phase difference between them till, so you can see about four to five cycles, you can achieve the pattern. 
And I want to mention again that the learning rule for some system is the Habian learning rules that we, it's a very simple uh, computations that allows to explore. So it's very easy to train uh, such um, neural networks. So from a single oscillator, as I mentioned, we want to be in this uh, negative differential resistance region, and we can do this via an external resistance or even uh, through um, device, so a transistor, where we can actually bias uh, the VO2 and we can have different methods and we can obtain the simulation. So we have an analytical method as well to understand the dynamics of a single oscillator. So from there, we can go to two oscillators where we actually now uh, understand also the impact of coupling. So here, for example, if the coupling is 10 kilo ohms, so it's a very strong um, uh, coupling. So we can see that both um, oscillators are in phase. So you can see there is no phase difference. So that's why they're both white pixels. And if you increase this coupling, that means there is now weaker coupling. There is current that will flow between two of them. And now you can see as well that they are in out of phase. So you can get one of the oscillators, so the second one to be a logic one or a black oscillator. So this is in the principle what is happening. And we can now have um, analytical formulation to understand the two coupled oscillators and then to upscale this to a larger scale ONN and to use for pattern recognition. So for many coupled oscillators, what is the challenge are how to determine these coupling weights. So how would you actually, from Hebian coefficients, you get numbers, but how would you actually implement that in hardware? So what would be the physical values for resistance and capacitance? And what if these oscillators have and devices have non-uniformities and variabilities? How do you overcome that? And these are some of the challenges that we have addressed. And we also have come up with uh, rigorous mathematical formulations to formulate, for example, the phases, so the in-phase and out-of-phase with respect to the uh, Hebian coefficient. There is, for example, very clearly, we know that resistive values that will provide in-phase and resistive values that will provide out-of-phase um, um, uh, relations. And in between, there is this bistability. And what we have um, fully uh, explored here is these coefficients that provide in-phase and out-of-phase, and we have the dedicated we have this mapping function that allows us to convert these weights into resistive and capacitive values. So now we can even have a pattern recognition flow. So we start with the patterns we store in the system, we compute the coefficients, we convert these coefficients into physical elements, and then we can perform design analysis, understanding the energy, for example, also accuracy as well as a function of input pixel noise is shown here. So this is, for example, the, the accuracy if we use resistive only coupling or resistive. So this is the resistive and capacitive. And the blue one is resistive coupling only as a function of the noisy pixels. This is of interest that it, it's a very robust when it comes to, to coupling using both resistive and capacitive um, coupling or synaptic elements between uh, oscillators. Also, I want to highlight again that the settling time, so the amount of cycles that it computes with ONN is rather fast, which is also something of interest. That means that we can lower the voltage amplitude, we can compute very fast, and these are two features, very advantageous features if we want to go to further in low power computing. In terms of um, uh, mitigating variabilities and non-uniformities, we have also explored the frequency harmony injection. So on the load um, transistor, at the gate of this transistor, we can provide a harmonic signal in order to be able to allow the oscillators to synchronize and to allow them to lock. So this has been a very, um, a, a very successful way of mitigating some of these variabilities and uniformities. And it's been seen here that up to 6% of mismatching oscillator frequency can be very easily handled and we can correct, obtain the correct output images on the pattern recognition. Now, this has been a lot of work on the analog uh, computing, but we have also, so as ultimately we will show this computing paradigm with um, molybdenum disulfide and vanadium dioxide um, devices. But to emulate this behavior, we have also performed and implemented this um, digitally. So a digital ONN a proof of concept. So the first question we asked is, does this computing in phase even work? Can we actually per, per, you know, perform some simple task and understand uh, what is the added value of such paradigm? So for that, we went into implement the digital oscillatory neural network on NFPGA. And this has been also explored to, uh, for example, for pattern recognition. 
on a 60 neuron ONN, where you have data from streaming camera, and also on um, a robot with various sensors and in order to avoid them. So there's been a lot of work into how to improve or how to train the ONN, what would be the patterns, and also um, what would be also the accuracy if you have to scale up. So how can you can maintain a very high accuracy if you scale up the system? I'll talk a little bit about them in the later slides. So here is on the first demonstrator. So this is this was our very first um, proof of concept. We were very excited on this to see that when you present um, images from a streaming camera, then you have in the memory of the oscillatory neural network, you have digits like this, and you can perform uh, a very fast computation with a, a reasonable accuracy with compared to the state of the art. So here is a little video of this. Um, so you can see here, this is the camera, and this is the, the, the phone that provides the fuzzy digits, the ONN on FPGA, and outputting on the screen. So the, cam the phone, the camera, the ONN, and, and the um, corrected output pattern. Um, as I mentioned, the other focus has been for robotic applications. So how this system, ONN, can perform, for example, real-time obstacle avoidance. And this has been uh, implemented on Arduino and FPGA, and we have two ONNs. One is to be able to understand, for example, if there is an obstacle, and the second one to make decisions, which can provide commands to the wheels. And this has been with eight sensors, and now we are currently also working into implementing it in a larger system. And here is a little, uh, you can see the robot uh, running here with the sensors. Um, so this was one of our earlier with eight um, sensors. So you can see um, the robot running. So I'll run it a little short. And the next focus of this work is to implement this on a robot, which is called E4 in a collaboration with AI Emergence, which is one of our partners in this project which has several other tasks. So it does face recognition, voice recognition, and other um, multimodal functionalities. And here the focus is to implement or embed ONNs as the neural network for performing um, obstacle avoidance with 15 sensors. So there are sensors throughout the robot, some of them looking forward, some of them on the ground to avoid, for example, stairs or, uh, or a wall or other type of um, uh, obstacles in the surrounding. And this is currently in development and will be embedded eventually to see this running on this, um, on this robot. But I would like to conclude here a little bit on the, so this is what we are doing in Neron, and I hope you will also follow us as we are continuing to work on this project, but I'd like to wrap up with the three main challenges of what's uh, in, memory in, in memory computing. And the first one is the synaptic um, uh, coupling and interconnect. So as I mentioned, this is um, a very challenge in terms of the how the, the synaptics are the main uh, area, but also where a lot of the power consumption is. And maybe one solution that also the community is going forward is to leverage 3D integration and monolithic 3D to overcome these challenges related to the interconnects. And also heterogeneous integration with various technology that can be very useful for, for in-memory and neuromorphic computing. I think that 3D integration and neuromorphic computing can be, or that's in another way to say neuromorphic computing could be the killer application for 3D, because that's exactly where we need a lot of this um, short interconnects, but also we need, we have several layers and that's where maybe the 3D integration can be a game changer for in-memory computing in order to be able to build a larger system and to have um, more capabilities in terms of learning. And the other challenge is on energy. So right, we need to look into not only beyond CMOS devices and, and uh, noble uh, devices such as memristors, but also the underlying architecture and what is the also the engineering aspect of it. So there is a lot of challenge on analog mixed signal design, also the, a lot of challenge with the peripheral circuitry. So maybe uh, also a message, takeaway message to the community there is, um, also for young students and researchers is there is a lot of effort that this community GDR saw can bring into neuromorphic computing by looking into the energy problem in, in, in this domain. And the other third one, which is crucial, is to be able to bring this self-learning or some reinforcement learning into these systems, especially as they are going to be edge devices where they need to have some way of learning and adapting to the system. 
And uh, recent advancements in neuroscience uh, need to be explored further in neuromorphics. So there is still this gap between what we know or what are some of the models, analytical or a lot of these computational models from neuroscience, how can it be implemented into hardware? This is still a gap there that needs to be also very well. And I think this community has a role to play there too. The other thing is a lot of this hardware randomness, right? So we have a lot of variabilities, noise, which can be very crucial for learning. And uh, so this is also something that you will further and strengthen this uh, self-learning reinforcement learnings in order to be able to make these systems more autonomous and also to be more, um, in order to be able to have real-time uh, processing and extraction of data. So a lot of this would require, as I mentioned, analog mixed signal design. So I think, um, so I wanna wrap up there, but there is a major role that this community can play from both the scalability, so 3D integration, ex um, design exploration, low power design, and also self-learning implementation. So with that, I'd like to wrap up. I'd like to acknowledge because this is um, a team effort and uh, colleagues from all the partners and also my students that are present there, I'd like to acknowledge their hard work uh, in making um, so far a near run of success and also moving forward into the years. And these are some of the references of the works that I've mentioned. And please get in touch if some of these sparks of interest and you want to discuss further. With that, I'd like to thank you and I'm open for discussions and questions. And I hope I didn't go over time. Merci Aida pour cette excellente présentation sur les réseaux de neurones à base d'oscillateurs. Euh, on court un peu après le temps, du coup on a le, juste le temps pour une toute petite question, s'il y en a une dans l'audience. Oui, donc on a une question. Alors, euh, donc l'utilisation de, de ces cellules mémoire, par exemple, ça serait pour euh, permettre l'utilisation d'IA dans les Edge. Le problème, c'est que parfois dans les edges, on est dans, dans les environnements sous contrainte et le contrôle des températures n'est peut-être pas toujours possible. Comment vous voyez cette question de la fiabilité de ces, de ces cellules mémoire dans les environnements où on ne peut pas forcément contrôler la température Ah, uh, um, very good question. I forgot to mention. So indeed, they are these devices have a phase change due to temperature, but they can only be uh, they can also be controlled electrically, so by voltage control. I forgot to mention that these are all they are not. It's not a thermal based system. That's a good point, especially on an edge device. You cannot control the temperature, but we can control the voltage. So this is all electrically controlled phase changes. Um, I, I didn't mention that, I apologize, but um, all these devices are, so this is in the end of the day, this is all voltage based. This is why we can lower the voltage, be able to have reliable oscillations. But to understand the switching mechanism of this device, the temperature is the key factor for us to, to dig in. And this is where a lot of the insights are coming from atomistic and TCAT simulations. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you. OK, euh, je, je suis vraiment désolé, même s'il y a encore des questions sûrement très intéressantes, notamment sur le question euh, et réponse euh, posées par Yann, mais on, on court un peu après le temps. Donc, on, je vous propose d'échanger de, 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 euh, offline et euh, on, va, on va passer au deuxième euh, présentateur.